So folks, old Donnie took a massive L, a giant L in court today, and it's based off his own actions. Again, this is why it's especially delicious to track the legal downfall, the downfall of Donald Trump, because this is a man who has all of the resources in the world, is a former president. If he wasn't such an egotistical, big mouth nut job, he would be able to have the best lawyers and defense in the world. Even if he was guilty, rich people often get away with crimes when they're guilty. But Donald Trump is convicting himself, and because of his big fat mouth, his threats, and his desire to delay everything, he has screwed himself. And the following really goes into how he was crushed in court today, both by Jack Smith and Alvin Bragg in different overlapping cases. Because remember, Donald Trump is making it very clear why he needs to be silenced. He is the biggest piece of evidence about the need for a gag order and his delay, delay, delay strategy, his desire to have all of these cases being pushed as far as they can might sound good in theory, but the judge today smacked him down and the timing screws him harder than ever before. Watch all of this. It's a big supercut of Donald Trump's legal failure. And I'm going to say something at the end, guys, that's going to shock your pants off in all the good ways. Or, or anything else that we just mentioned here. But uh, there, there was, as we watched Alvin Bragg approach this trial date, uh, there were reasons to wonder, is the district attorney's office learning from what we're seeing in the various courtrooms around America that Donald Trump has infected, especially in New York City, where in one courtroom, things were kind of out of control. In another courtroom, they were very much in control. This filing uh, today seems to indicate that the district attorney's office has fully figured out uh, what Donald Trump wants to do in the courtroom, in and around the courtroom, and it looks like they're planning to try to stop it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, they have learned. And one of the things that they could look to is not just Judge Ngoran, who issued a limited gag order with respect to attacking the judge's law clerk. Um, but they've learned from Judge Chutkin and the D.C. Circuit case and the recently concluded Judge Kaplan case involving E. Jean Carroll. And just to focus on the D.C. case, the D.C. case um, has a circuit court that is a, you know, a very lengthy decision about that gag order, largely affirming it. And the relief that the district attorney's office is seeking closely tracks that, including a footnote in the D.C. Circuit decision dealing with what the court's power is to deal with protection of witnesses and jurors at a trial. So they clearly looked at that and are taking steps. But I have to say that's sort of the small bore view of what's going on here. They've learned they don't want to put up with any nonsense. They have a judge, Judge Mershon, who by all accounts is very similar to Judge Kaplan. But in reading the submission, which is hundreds of pages, it is a report card on America. You, if you want to know what we have devolved into and what Trump has unleashed um, with nobody um, who is in sort of the, in a position of responsibility in the Republican Party saying this has to stop, um, you know, threatening violence is not an appropriate response. Uh, just looking at this submission, it is so disheartening as to what has happened to America, because this shouldn't be an issue of politics. This is just like, you know, Russian interference is not an issue of politics. Engaging in violence to threaten jurors and to affect witnesses is something that is so beyond the pale and it is completely documented by the district attorney's office. And, and Joyce, one of the reasons I wanted to read the affidavit about Alvin Bragg in particular is he's the exception. Alvin Bragg is carving himself out as a sacrificial exception to Donald Trump. You can continue to send the death threats his way. Donald Trump can continue to inspire death threats against Alvin Bragg and call him anything he wants to call him. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's that Alvin Bragg is trying to protect everyone else in the courtroom. 
It's a really remarkable commitment from Alvin Bragg, and it shows the kind of public servant that he is. I mean, you read those specific threats, people who talk about standing over him with their 9 millimeter weapons. Um, but Alvin Bragg did something smart here. He tracked, as Andrew said, this uh, protective order in the District of Columbia. And he did that because when you're a judge, you really like to have a similar ruling that you mm -hmm. can hang your hat on. You know you're not going to get reversed, especially when the Court of Appeals in the District of Columbia has already affirmed this sort of an order. You're in very safe territory when you enter it. And Donald Trump has done nothing but give Judge Mershon reasons to accept this order from the DA. Trace Vance and Andrew Weissman, thank you both very much for starting off our discussion. Cases, and let's start with the one that is on the horizon, the New York case, the hush money case, just now less than a month away from scheduled to start. What are a few things that you have in here that, that we need to know? So I think one thing that's really interesting about the New York Manhattan DA's case is that it's sort of an amuse bouche for what comes later. And I think Alvin Bragg has begun talking about it in this way as well. This is about a species of election interference, paying someone hush money in order to keep an indiscretion, not only from your wife, but also from the American electorate. That's what's alleged in this indictment. And so we connect these dots and it's actually even bigger, I think, than the tag hush money trial makes out makes it out to be. You know, this was a situation where you were not only paying hush money, falsifying business records to do that allegedly, but you were also involving a media titan the National Enquirer, as part of this catch and kill scheme to keep these indiscretions from the American public. And so you see this laid out in Manhattan DA's indictment. It's going to play out in the trial. But more importantly, it also relates to what later comes in the other indictments and the other trials that may also happen, because this is sort of a precursor to what's also charged in those other indictments. Again, election interference only this time on a much broader scale. And Andrew, as you point out in the book, some of these checks are alleged to have been signed while Donald Trump was in the White House, while he was president of the United States. So um, we know that his defense team is filing all kinds of motions and trying to keep Stormy Daniels and Michael Cohen off the witness stand and on and on and on. How do you see this playing out? Well, what's really interesting when you when we were writing this, we were noticing that this is about criminality that's charged for before he was president, while he was president and after he was president. I mean, this is sort of an incredible array of crimes. Um, just as, let's take the Florida case where he recently filed another motion saying that he's immune. But of course, that happened after he was president. So if you think the D.C. case was sort of outlandish to say I can kill people without um, being held criminally to mm. account for that. This is actually saying in a case after he is president, oh, you know what, I can do that too. And you know, I suspect he would like to say even before I was president, I can do it. They're, those are all not great arguments, but they buy him something, which is delay. Um, you know, we're sitting here today waiting for the Supreme Court to decide whether Judge Chuckin in the <laughs> DC case can give that a green light. Um, and it, that is what he gets, even when he's making arguments that are plainly frivolous. Um, and then one thing, Melissa, and I have really talked about is it is important to even though we're keeping an eye on sort of what will ultimately happen in criminal trials. Donald Trump now is telling us who he is yeah. um, by the arguments that he is making about saying the president should not be held to be criminally liable for you know, killing people um, or he can take classified documents and that should be legal. That is telling us now something about who is running for office. Yeah, and the immunity question, Mika, Donald Trump effectively said, yeah, actually, I think I could use SEAL Team 6 to take out one of my political opponents and enjoy immunity to do that. Yeah, yeah, no, he said mm -hmm. that, and he it did. just doesn't yeah. make any difference among Republicans, but we'll put that aside for now. Andrew, I'm curious, because you, you mentioned that he, he has this delay tactic, he buys time. Um, are any of these criminal trials, do any of them pack a consequential punch if convicted in time before the election, or can they all have time be bought on them by the attorneys and delayed and delayed and delayed? So I think I would say that in the prediction mode, I would say Florida and Georgia are ones that I would not put, a, put my money on them happening before the general election. But I do think that um, obviously New York is about to happen and that is going to go forward. 
uh, and I think D.C., depending on what the Supreme Court does and sort of the betting is that they, they're they not going to take the case. And so that would also allow that case to go forward. And I think leaving aside you know, what happens in terms of whether there's a conviction or not, one of the things that will happen that obviously Donald Trump does not want to happen is there will be facts, facts laid out in court um, for people to see, for us to cover um, so that what the, the public is seeing is not just Donald Trump's spin and what he wants to say publicly, which can be false. Uh, um, this is one where it'll be incumbent on the government to prove its case, but there will actually be a sort of that daily drip, drip, drip of factual evidence in both the Manhattan case and in the D.C. case when that goes. And I do suspect both of those will happen before the election. So, Melissa, Andrew mentioned Georgia. Uh, that case has been sort of mired over the last couple of weeks and whether Fannie Willis split the dinner bill on a trip to Belize with somebody and who paid cash for mm -hmm. what. But taking a step back, mm -hmm. the evidence in the case, there's there's a phone call. Yeah. There's a phone call where yeah. the President of the United States is asking for the election to be overturned and the Secretary of State uh, denying him uh, in his request. T we can talk about the Fannie Willis question that first. Does that hurt this trial? Mm -hmm. And if not, how strong is the case against Donald Trump there? So, again, it's really important to understand that the ethical accusations, allegations made against Fannie Willis are really unorthodox. Typically, when you have allegations about prosecutorial misconduct, it's usually about violations with regard to a prosecutor having a relationship with a juror or a litigant or the judge, not with someone else on her own team. So by itself, that was really unusual. And again, Money is fungible. Um, if Nathan Wade is paying for something and then he is reimbursed, it's not like he got this job so that he could take Fannie Willis to China. Yes, Donald Trump won when the first thing he said on the podium was how united the party was. It's certainly not. Nikki Haley got roughly 40 percent of the vote. Yes, it's her home state, but it is a deep red state where both Republican senators are fawning all over Donald Trump. What do those results tell you? Well, look, I think that's a repeat uh, electorally of Iowa, New Hampshire, and now South Carolina. Trump has not consolidated his base, has not consolidated the Republican Party. And so what I would say is this, is that she is going to stay in the race however long it is. And you know what? I'm agnostic, Stephanie, as to why she stays in, if it's for 2028 or because she's waiting around for Trump to get sick or get arrested or whatever it is. Like, I don't care. I'm glad she's out there. And I think she should stay out there as long as she wants to, as long as she can make a, a dent in him. From my perspective, that's good for all of us. And what I would say is this, is that if you look at the Michigan or excuse me, at the South Carolina results, there were 25 percent of people in South Carolina, Republican primary voters who said they wouldn't vote for Trump. That is catastrophic, singularly catastrophic for Trump. He doesn't he can't lose more votes, Stephanie. He can't. He's got a majority, vast majority, 90 some percent white coalition. Right. It is a big monolith. And right now what we're seeing is cracks in that monolith. And the more he does this year, the crazier he's going to be. Remember, the way to keep his base fired up is to say and do crazier and crazier things. And as he does that, he will push more and more Nikki Haley type Republicans back into the undecided pool. So, Don, th those 25 percent. So, yeah, you can see what's happening. Donald Trump, how he acted before these trials and during these trials, how he's talked about witnesses and and, and other sides of the trials and judges and prosecutors he is the reason he will be gagged. Simple as that. And by delaying and delaying and delaying, he's actually put some of these trials, which may have happened last year or very, very early this year, pushed them right into the election window. If some of these trials happened last year, early this year, when a lot of regular voters aren't paying attention, it might not have hurt him as much as it should have. But with him pushing all of the trials into the election swing season, when everyone is paying attention, he has doomed himself.